like it. It's good to be in the house living God. Did you enjoy that? I sure did. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Nellie. What a beautiful ministry. Um, it's nice to, to have somebody behind playing the music that we actually can see once in a while, isn't it? It's kind of nice. Yeah. Oh, I missed it. Well, I don't know if that's back to normal. I, I would like to think we're back to normal. Normal is what we bring in every day, right? Uh, every Sunday. That's normal. Um, I think the church is always pressing forward, trying to reach each new generation and trying to be uh, relevant in each and every current culture. And uh, so that's what we're doing. To those of you online, welcome. For those of you online, we're glad that you've joined us. want to welcome you to the service as well. Um, this is the first Sunday of Advent. And um, about the closest we're going to come to Christmas today, uh, other than the beautiful decoration. By the way, thank you to all of you who worked so hard this week. There were several of them who came up uh, a couple days and worked on this. Um, I just want to say thank you. Looks looks awesome. Looks great. Um, what else? I think I think that about covers it. The only only other announcement I I heard. Someone said to me, oh, it's so good to see Debbie's back. Um, Debbie said to me this morning, she said, uh, I, I don't feel the greatest, but I'm going to go because uh, when I don't go, you're just a little off. And I shared with her, honey, I'm a little off whether you come or not. Um, I'm just a little more off when she doesn't come. Can I get an amen? I am convinced that he is able to keep that which I've committed. But the real question is, you've gathered in here. How about you? Are you convinced? Are you persuaded? Yeah. Father, for many of us, it was a long, long time ago when we gave our hearts and turned our lives over to you. Some here today have served for decades the living God. Some, they don't even have a year in. For all, it is our heart's desire and our greatest pleasure to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who paid the price for our salvation. And all we have to say today is to God be all the honor, to God be all the glory, for great things he has done. And all the people of God said, and amen. Everybody read with me. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. He is good, he is above all things, 
Father, we come to you in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Oh, the sweet, sweet, sweetness of God Almighty. Lord, as we come to you, we come, we come with our hearts cup turned right side up. We come, Lord God, because we know we have been blessed beyond measure. We come, Lord God, because we want to exalt the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We come, Lord God, because you are worthy of our praise. This morning, Father, I want to lift to you the congregation. And as we pray for one another, Father, I ask that you would meet each and every need that is... Uh, in our number that need your touch physically. We have those in our number that need your help financially. We have those in our ranks, Lord God, whose relationships are severed and need help and wondering how in the world they're ever going to be reconciliation if it's not for you. We have those, Lord God, in our number who struggle with anxiety and whose mental health is not where it needs to be. Lord God, we just come to you. Whose emotional state, Lord God, needs to be one of that is reassured. Each one of us, Father, need to know your love, your grace and mercy, your forgiveness. We need to sense your touch fresh. Oh, how we need you. We need you every hour. Father, we come to you today. We pray for our neighbors. We don't need to ask you who is our neighbor. 
We know that you send us into the world. The world is our neighbor. What we ask for, Lord God, is just a love that's like yours, a compassion. speaks to others, Lord, in a way that they know that they matter. We ask, Father, for the words of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have what the world is looking for. Make us your ambassadors. Ambassadors of love. Father, we pray today for those in leadership those in leadership in our companies, in the marketplace, those in leadership, Lord, in our city, in our state, in our nation. in the way that you've taught us your will be done here on earth as in heaven today Lord we want to we want to stop and pause and say thank you we are grateful we're grateful for this week this week of thanksgiving we're grateful Lord for the week to come we're grateful for all the blessings we have we're grateful in the good times we're grateful in the bad times we thank you, Lord, for your incarnation. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Lord God, for the empty tomb. We thank you for the ascension. We thank you for your spirit in us. Jesus, we love you. With our being, we love you. And all the people of God said, and amen.
we celebrate the Christmas Advent. We light the candles. And um, um, as we go through them, then we'll be together on Christmas Eve for many of us and do a service there. And um, I do this. I didn't always do this in my ministry. But I do this in my ministry probably the past 20, 25 years. began to realize uh, I wasn't a big one on, on these kind of traditions. Um, but I realize how important it is for us to get our hearts and get our minds set up for Christmas. It's more than just getting all those checks on our list of people that we are buying for, you know, looking for that great deal, too. Uh, it's way more than that. It's what Christ has done for us. So this first week is Christ who is our hope. I'm going to light this candle. Maybe. Christ who is hope. Isaiah wrote in 62, For darkness shall cover the earth, and the thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise, arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. And as we light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope, may the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. It's been fun. I'm going to wrap it up today. I, I think I could probably preach at least six or seven more weeks on the topic of prayer. Um, but Christmas is coming, and we do need to change our focus um, to the coming, the first in celebration of the first coming of Christ as we look forward to his second coming. And uh, what a day that will be, right? When my Jesus, I shall see. Before I begin, I just want to say a great big thanks to the ladies for all their work uh, in the music. It's been nice. Uh, certainly not without any with any snags and snafus, but hey, that's the way it rolls when you do this stuff live. Um, we, we presented a challenge for the guys in the back as well. Um, the PowerPoint we're not using a program that we once used. It's not on this computer. We, we need to buy it, several hundred dollars a year. Uh, that's how that rolls. We, we haven't really figured out which one we want to use for presentation. Um, till we get there, this is, this is the way it will be. But it's nice to have them, and I just want to say thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is part of, of a prayer se series, part three. We have been dealing with uh, out of Chronicles 714, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their lands. A couple weeks ago on the first um, of the series, uh, first week of the series, we went over the Lord's Prayer when Jesus taught them how to pray and he taught us how to pray and really took a look at how we pray. And then uh, as we went over the Lord's Prayer, and uh, just, just to remind you, it's all about his will, the Lord's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And, um, and, and then we learned a few other things along the way, but the primary point being that it's all about Jesus, not about us. It's about accomplishing what God wants to accomplish on earth and sharing the good news. Last week, we dealt with, uh, the title of it was Taking a Stand. And we looked at prayer from Ephesians, the sixth chapter, when we're putting on the full armor of God in preparation of prayer, that there's a, there's a work to be done in essence, that we fight a battle. And this battle is not on flesh and blood. It's not about people. We don't fight with people. We fight in the heavenly, uh, heavenly realms. We fight the, the forces of darkness, the ideologies that we often see in the current culture. That's bigger than people, folks. It's a way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking that the enemy has introduced. <coughs> and the enemy has produced. He's after our children. 
He certainly is in our educational system. We have but to look at CRT, uh, for those of you who may not know, or those of you who are tuning in, critical race theory. Um, <coughs> we have but to look at, at some of the recent laws that have been passed in our generation on marriage and the redefinition of marriage, something that God has de designed and defined. Um, and we as a church still hold on to God's definition. <coughs> this week, <coughs> excuse me, this week I want to speak for a few moments about a prayer gone wrong. I had mentioned it last week, um, and we're going to look at Jonah. <coughs> and uh, I had debated, I had debated um, whether I'd move on into Christmas and maybe pick this up at the first of the year. But um, uh, in last week's Light for the Journey, Tim had some sway over the leadership here, and he said he wanted to see uh, a continuation of the series, can't wait for the next series. And so it just felt like I would do one more week and then wrap it up. Um, I want to give you a working definition of prayer. It's actually quite simple. I mean, what is prayer? I mean, we've talked about how to do it, um, you know, uh, how to have a good prayer, learn it from Jesus, the master. Uh, we looked at the importance of prayer, that there's a great war going on, and we need to be um, praying all the time in all seasons. We need to be prepared for the work that we do, that there is a work to be done, and it's done in the heavenly realms. And I would just say, with regards to last week's message in the heavenly realms, every time we go to prayer, we go into the heavenly realms. We go before the throne of God, and we open up the heavens, and it's as if a window opens up, and uh, there is uh, this prayer that goes on. But what is prayer? It's a great question, isn't it? What is prayer? If I was asked you, what is prayer? Don't say it, but what would be your definition? <clears throat> well, in short... I hope today you understand that prayer is so much more than what we think it is. What prayer actually is, is communication with God. Prayer is communication with God. That is that God and, and you and God and I are are not just conversing, but we are communicating. Now, I, I just want to stop for a moment. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> this was communication. She is paying attention. Communication or prayer has many forms. Not only does it have many forms, communication can be, or prayer, can be initiated either by God or by the individual. I feel hemmed in. So, prayer involves... Uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about what prayer produces and the very forms, various forms of prayer. But God can initiate prayer. Prayer doesn't have to start with from us. Sometimes God starts the prayer. In fact, I'll be real honest with you. Most of the time, God is way ahead of us initiating communication or prayer in all kinds of forms. And then sometimes we think that we're the ones actually initiating, and sometimes we do. We go to God in prayer. Keep in mind that prayer is communication. 
If it is communication with God, then it can take the form of conversation. You know what it is to have a conversation, right, Charlie? You, yeah, we're having a conversation now. I'm doing the talking, you're doing the nodding. You know, we're, 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 we're just having a conversation. I talk, God talks. You talk, God talks. God talks. You, you Prayer also um, is, has a form of revelation. Sometimes in communication, if prayer is communication, sometimes God reveals to us. Is that not communicating to us? Of course it is. So revealing is a part of communication. It's a part of prayer. If you stop and think about this just for a moment, if the Holy Spirit gives us discernment, is that not God revealing something to us? Of course it is. I have to come back up for the camera's sake. You know what this is, right? It's the Bible, right? It contains God's word, yes? Of course it does. What is God trying to do with this book? If not communicate, if not initiate a prayer to us, a revelation, God is one of the biggest jobs for us, one of the most difficult things for us, is uh, for us to get an idea and a concept of who God is, God must reveal himself constantly to us. Many people understand this. They say, oh, if God will just give me a sign, okay? So if, if it's communication with God, then it's going to take the work. It can take on the several forms. One is conversation. A second one is revelation. A third form is instruction, a fourth, you know what I mean, instruction. God comes along and he instructs us. He does it in a whole lot of ways, but it's still God communicating to us and letting us know what he wants, wants us to do. Um, not only is it instruction, but it can be the form of intercession where, we, where, 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 you, where you do something on behalf of someone else. Most of the time, God is interceding for you and I. That God comes in and um, he covers when we don't, how many of you ever been there? I've been there when I don't even know how to pray anymore. I've, I've, I've exhausted a topic. I've looked at somebody. I've, I've done this with people who have struggled with cancer, and I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed over them. Lord, help them. I don't want to understand all this stuff. And then, and then there's a point when I come to, well, I don't even know what to say to you, God, anymore. Would you just take over? Help me out. I don't know what to say. We just have moans and groans. There have been times in my life when I've had devastation happen and all I can do is I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. It's possible, folks, believe me. Pastor Carl, without any words. Ever been there? So it's intercession. The Spirit intercedes for us often. When, when all we have is moans and groans and we don't know what to do, then there is, prayer can come in a form of a message conveyed through others. I'll be praying away and all of a sudden someone comes along and speaks into my life about a subject that was all related. They had no idea. Ever been there? Of course you have. Listen to me. That is God speaking to us. That is prayer initiated by God. God is, God is we're talking to God about a circumstance or a situation uh, we don't know what to do, and all of a sudden God sends someone in. It, can, it is fascinating to me. Oftentimes it will come through a child, but not always. Sometimes it will come through a coworker, or sometimes it comes through uh, uh, somebody in the church. I just lost my sermon. How did that happen? i got to stop using my hands. Well... It can come through, it, it can, I'm just going to put this, 
It can come through, uh, uh, conveyed through a message from others. You remember, um, remember when Joseph was uh, about to marry, things over on Christmas, about to marry Mary, and she came up pregnant? God sent an angel. Joseph was trying to figure out, he was praying about, and he was talking to God about and communicating with God. What am I supposed to do with this girl when God comes along and he communicates through an angel? Doesn't always do it through an angel, but he can do it through whomever he wants. But sometimes prayer is a message conveyed through others. Sometimes prayer is answered and conveyed and understood through education or understanding. When God begins to reveal himself and we are illuminated, we've stepped into the light. We're no longer ignorant. We're educated. And God reveals and discloses and opens up to new ways and new places in our lives, and that is communication with God. That, my friends, is prayer. Sometimes the form of prayer, it it, it comes... um, Through impressions, where God impresses upon your heart that um, to the point where you become burdened. It's, it's God just doesn't let it go. God keeps bringing up a, 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 a subject and he just doesn't let it go. God keeps bringing up an issue and he doesn't let it go. He keeps bringing up a person and they just don't get off your mind. They won't get off your heart. That they're just an impression. But God is trying to reveal to us something that he wants done or someone he wants spoken to or somebody he wants touched by you. And so God begins to speak to you through impressions. Sometimes it's through communicates, such as the written word. I can recall times when I've been in prayer over the church and in deep grief over where we would go next. I remember in my first church, I was kneeling by my bed and we were going through a season and I thought, Lord, I don't even know what to do as a leader. I need your help. Would you please help me? And, of course, when you aren't given leadership, everybody else is happy to. And I knew wherever, whatever the church was involved in at the time, that wasn't where God really wanted to go. But I didn't know what he really wanted us to do or where he wanted us to go. And I remember, I remember being there beside my bed, kneeling, and I'd prayed as I'd often been praying. It was in a season of prayer. It was interesting. And impressions, and God was using every form of communication, but... Um, I was praying one night, and he uh, put a verse in my head. And that verse, I thought, I thought, is that even in the Bible? So when I finished praying, the next morning I got up, and I thought, I've got to find out. And I went and did a search, a word search, and sure enough, the what God, I didn't, I don't ever remember reading it, but what God had said to me about the word was in the Bible. God uses His word to communicate to us. And God, through his word, is is in a form of communication which makes it prayer. Have you not found it interesting that those of us who have served God for um, for many decades, that the more we read this, we can read it over and over and over, just like I did with the the book of Jonah um, as I I prepared for this message. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've read it. I've heard it over and over and over again. I've heard it in Sunday school. I've used it in Sunday school. I've taught it to children when I did children's church. I've preached from it multiple times. This is probably the third or fourth time since I've been here that I've preached on Jonah. And every time God says something different. Have you noticed that? As you read through the scriptures, you read it over and God says something new. Don't tell me it isn't prayer. It is. It is God communicating to you and I. And it makes his word alive, as it says it is, alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. And it speaks and it communicates the things of God. And it moves and it illustrates to us that 
what God is doing. And one last form that I would like to share with you. So I've shared, let me just see if I can do the list here. Uh, conversation, revelation, instruction, intercession, a message conveyed through others, education or understanding, impressions, um, communiques, often through the word. And last, the last couple that I want to share with you is visions or dreams. Don't tell me they're not prayers. I don't know if you've ever experienced a vision. I have one in all my walk with God. One time. Only takes one. You know, I thought it was so fascinating. In my vision, Jesus came to visit me. That's all I'll share about it. But when he visited me, he never said a word. You know what's so fascinating about it? I cried for three weeks. I couldn't believe the master would love me that much, pay me that much mind. I had shared with my wife. I remember I, the, the, the day of, I had got down on the sofa. I was, I was weeping and sobbing. I'd been with the Lord, and I knew I'd been with the Lord. It was really strange. It was weird. It was, I was asleep, and then I wasn't. But I was with the Lord. And while Jesus never said a word, I understood. I understood everything he needed me to understand. Sometimes prayer comes through visions or dreams. And lastly, prayer, and you know it's true. I talked to a lot of people who uh, say they believe in God and they believe that going to church is going outdoors in nature. Prayer can come in the form of creation. Ever been out there in some of them breathtaking places? Been to West Virginia up there in the mountains when the clouds, and you can see the clouds, and you're up there in the clouds overlooking some breathtaking scene. The place where my wife's folks grew up, they kept that homestead, and we would go up there, and it was on top of the mountain, and we would look out over the mountain. At one time, they owned all everything your eye could see. They sold it off to pay taxes. Don't you just love the IRS? The prayer can be in the form of creation. In the form of creation, God begins to reveal himself and he begins to speak, he begins to communicate. Well, not only does prayer have many forms, um, I'd also like to talk, talk to a little bit about what prayer involves. Prayer involves, A, listening. Prayer involves sometimes speaking. Prayer involves Action or inaction. Prayer involves obedience or disobedience. Prayer involves always grace. Fancy theological term I learned when I was in college. Learned about Grace, and then I learned about prevenient grace. You know what prevenient grace is? Prevenient grace is the grace that goes to non-believers before they ever come to Christ. Prayer will involve position or station. We oftentimes, physically, will see it manifested when we realize our station, we, we think about God's station we realize our position and we think about God's position, high and holy and exalted, and we find ourselves, and, and you know what I'm talking about, sometimes even as you get older, sometimes nothing will do but getting down on your knees or falling on your face. You know what I'm talking about. I have times when I've crashed into the bed tired and praying and thought, no, I need to get on my knees and crawl out of bed. 
Not that, not that it makes my prayer any more uh, effective. That's that's not the case, or not that that means that I love God more or less. It just means that I have become, God has communicated to me who he is and who I am. Where he belongs in this world, where I belong in this world. So prayer involves listening, speaking, actions, inactions, obedience, disobedience, grace, and station or position. Prayer produces. Did you know prayer produces? It does. Prayer has almost this kind of byproduct, sort of like what happiness is. Happiness is actually a a byproduct. It's produced, um, and it's not produced by more money, Just, just so you know. But prayer also, like like it, it produces, um, here's what prayer produces. It produces salvation. There is no coming to the Lord without calling to the Lord and having that conversation with Jesus Christ, with God the Father. It involves salvation. Um, it involves, uh, or it produces salvation. It produces Prayer produces relationship. If you pray to God and you communicate to God on a regular basis uh, without ending, all the time, you will discover that your relationship with God will develop and grow. So prayer produces salvation. It produces relationship. It produces gratitude, thankfulness. It produces trust. It produces fidelity, faithfulness. It produces hope. Doesn't it? Prayer gives us hope. We go to God in a hopeless circumstance. We find talking to God. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Produces hope. It produces vision or understanding. You know, education, illumination, produces vision, and it produces mission. Now, I've shared all this because um, I think in this particular life series of prayer that we're about to look at, um, we, we can see all of this transpiring, Okay. And you'll see it with me. Now, we're just going to, I'm not going to read all of Job, or all of Jonah, rather. I'm not going to read all of Jonah. Uh, I, I've just, I plucked out second chapter, which is a prayer. I plucked out of first chapter, three verses, and the last chapter, three verses, which is prayer. Some of the prayer is initiated by God. Some of it's initiated by Jonah. And we find all of these um, different forms. We find several of the different forms. We find um, the different initiations. We find the different, um, um, uh, what it involves. We we get some of that going on, and I'll, I'll point it out to you in, in some of what it produces, okay? But what happens when prayer goes wrong? Let's take a look at Jonah. <coughs> in Jonah, starting with chapter one, I want to read the first three Three verses. Here we're going to find God is initiating prayer. He's going to do it through the form of the word. Um, in verse 1, it says this. Uh, Tim, can you, you got it up here for me, bud? He's still working on it. Okay. Thank you, buddy. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it for Their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish uh, from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, bought a ticket, and went uh, went down into it to go uh, with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Here we are. We find that the Lord has initiated a prayer with Jonah. He is communicating to Jonah. Uh, the word of the Lord came, and uh, the Lord spoke to Jonah and said, Jonah, I got a message I need you to take to Nineveh for me. And uh, when I when you get there, I here's the message. He shares with him, here's the message. I want you to tell them 
that uh, their evil has come up before me. You go tell them that, Jonah. And what Jonah decides is that, and what you don't know or you may not know that Jonah did know is that Nineveh was the chief capital city of the enemy. The enemy of God, the enemy of Israel, the enemy. I mean, these are, these are the individuals who are carrying out evil. They are the culture that, um, that Jonah stood against. They're not the called out ones. God has just given uh, the, the, the message that they, their evil has come up before him. That is so heinous that God has a mission for Jonah. And he says to Jonah, he communicates to Jonah, Jonah, I want you get to go to Nineveh. But Jonah won't have anything to do with it. I don't know why Jonah decided he didn't want to listen to God. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. He would rather go somewhere else. In fact, what the scriptures teach us is that Jonah did 180 degrees, and instead of going to Nineveh, he went to, said to, sent to Tarshish anywhere. He's running from the presence of the Lord. God wants him to do something. Have you ever been there in your prayers and in God's communication with you? God has got his hand on you. I remember when God was calling me to the ministry. That that was one of the toughest things that I ever done. I was a true Jonah. Uh, not for the same reasons, not because I felt like I was going to the enemy, but I felt like I was inadequate. You ever been there? God's asking you to talk to somebody about Jesus, and you think, man, let's get the pastor to do it. He's got all the education. But God isn't asking the pastor to do it. God's asking you to do it. And when God was asking me to become a pastor, I was sure he was asking the wrong person. So for five years, I said no to God. When I finally said, okay, God, I'm going to try it your way. And when I fail, I, I really did. I said this to God. When I fail, you can get your thumb out of my back. Thank you very much. Well, I'm still waiting to pay him. This is where Jonah is. I want to move us to, to uh, Jonah's prayer. So what, what has happened here? Jonah is going the other way. He gets on the ship. He heads in the ship, and he gets out, out, in, the, out in the sea, not very far, headed to headed uh, to Tarshish, headed 180 degrees in the wrong direction, not wanting to go where God wants him to go. He's not in obedience. He's in disobedience. This is a prayer where God is initiated and Jonah has gone the other way. I want to tell you, this is a prayer gone wrong. And as Jonah heads the other way, he's out at sea and he goes down into the belly of the ship and he's down in the ship hiding out and they come up against the weather and the weather is, and if you read it in chapter one, in, in, in chapter one and chapter two, uh, we'll look at his prayer. In chapter one, you'll find out that the, all the deckhands had been praying to their gods. They had come to the place where they said they were sure. And I don't know if you've ever been out in a storm. I was out in Lake Erie one time with my friend and, and my at the time, Debbie was my girlfriend. We were out with his wife, my friend and his wife. He had a little 16-foot boat. Um, I, I don't remember what. Uh, he had an outboard motor. I don't know if it was a 50-horse. I don't think it was quite that powerful. Probably a 25, 30-horse engine on it. And when the storm cooked up and we got on to Catawba Island, we, the, it, it blew over. So we thought, and we thought we'd head back to the mainland. And so we headed back uh, to the shore uh, we had about two miles to go. Catawba Island's a couple miles out in uh, out in Lake Erie, and we, we the storm it just it just did a circle and just came right back. And we hit some three foot waves, and then we hit some four footers. And we're in this little boat, and as he's trying to keep it on on track and turning in into the waves, and the boat would go up, and the boat would come down, and it would smack on the waves. And every time it smacked on the waves, I was sure that it was going to bust. Boom, boom, boom. We just kept going on. Boom, 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 boom. And I mean, we're up on a wave and then down we would go and the, the, the boat would be airborne. And, and I was just sure we were never going to see dry land. My girlfriend began to sing. 
She started to sing a hymn. I don't remember what the hymn was, but I recognized it. I remember that. And she began to pray. Well, Jonah's out there in uh, this, the boat to the ship that he's on. Uh, the sailors are all out there, and they begin to lighten the load. So they're throwing over their precious cargo. They're praying to their gods. They're heathens. They're praying to their gods. As they're praying to their gods, um, Jonah's down in the, in, in, in the belly of the ship. He's down in the ship, and, and they, they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They wanted to know who who had not appeased the gods. This had to be something that the gods had done. And Jonah said, yep, it's me. And they said, well, what, what do we got to do? What did you do? And he said, well, I'm, I'm in rebellion. I, God has asked me to do something, and I'm headed the other way. I'm running from the presence of the Lord. So, oh, my goodness, what do we do? And he said, well, you throw me over. And they said, no, we can't do it. We, they did everything they could to keep from throwing him over. Finally, finally, they decided that if God can do all this and make this storm, that they better pray too. I got to tell you, when my, my girlfriend was singing hymns and praying, I thought, maybe I ought to give that a try. I didn't know the Lord. I was sure scared. And so they threw him over, and they prayed to get to the Lord. And they said, "Lord, please don't don't hold us against uh, hold this against us." And they 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 actually sacrificed to God. It was cool, cool sight. Over Jonah goes. Fascinating thing is that the Scripture says I I never think of this as a provision, but 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 one of the names for God is provider. God provided a great fish, and as He provides the great fish, a fish comes along and swallows up Jonah. Three days He's inside this fish. Let's look at verse at chapter two. Here's what happens to Jonah inside this fish. Then Jonah, verse one, chapter two. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of, of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. I want to, verse 2 is really, really kind of important here, and I, I want to share a couple thoughts here. First of all, Sheol can mean hell or death or Hades. The other thing I want to point out is that here in this version, it says, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. And the word, um, the word he answered me in other versions says, and he heard me. When I looked at the, when I looked at the Hebrew uh, of this word, it meant that, that if, you tr if you understood its true, tr true meaning, is that God was paying attention. Jonah got God's attention. And notice that it says it twice, uh, that he heard me. Here it says answered in this version, but in other versions, like the King James said, and he heard me. <coughs> Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and he heard my voice. The first heard that was that, that Jonah had gotten God's attention. God is paying mine. Okay, Jonah, I see where you're at. The second heard me is that God began to listen to Jonah's cry, what Jonah was saying to God. I prayed, Jonah prayed to the Lord, uh, his God, from the belly of a fish. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he, uh, he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and all your waves are... Uh, and your billows pass over me. Now he's just kind of describing the predicament that he's in. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. And by the way, isn't that where Jonah wanted to go? In the presence of the Lord? I am driven uh, away by, from your sight. I, I shall again look upon your holy temple. Oh, Jonah must have read Job. I'm again, I will look upon your temple. Jonah knows there's a day coming when he trusts in the Lord. He said, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your 
Notice where, remember what I preached last week? Into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their, now get this, verses 8, 9, and 10 are key. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. There it is, hope. You see it? But I, with a voice of, there it is, thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, there it is, fidelity. What I have vowed, I will pay. There it is, salvation. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon dry land. God is good. And all the time. Amen. I want to take you to the end of the book of Jonah, the fourth chapter. I want to look at the fourth chapter, then we'll wrap this thing up. In chapter 4, starting with verse 9, 10, and 11, here's another prayer initiated by God. Jonah has gone into Nineveh. In chapter 3, you'll, you'll discover he went into Nineveh. Uh, he did what the Lord had asked him to do. Finally, he got with God's program, went into Nineveh. Um, he went in and he he. he preached this message. It was a fascinating message. It was a short message. He preached it uh, all day long. He just kept moving on and the same announcement. He was basically just making a proclamation, 40 more days and then your death. 40 more days and then your destruction. 40 more days and then your destruction. Well, what happened is, is that God had caused them to respond to the message of God. Imagine that. The go figure. God knows what he's doing. And so now, Jonah's down there. He's preaching uh, 40 more days, and you're, you're toast. You're history. You're out of here. He's kind of liking this message. I mean, this kind of works for him. 40 more days, baby, and you're all gods. You're gone. You're history. And they, they looked at it, and they took God at his word, and they said, oh, my goodness, what can we do? And they began to repent, and they put on sackcloth, and they, they covered themselves in ashes. They started doing what God's people would do. They, they began to, to lament over their sin, and they repented, and they stopped their sin. And God had compassion on them. And Jonah thought, man, I'm going to go up, and I'm going to wait for these 40 days. I'm going to watch this thing happen. This will be the coolest thing, man. We're going to get rid of the chief city of the enemy he goes up on the he goes up on the hill and he's watching over the city and as he's watching over the city it's a hot hot day and as it gets hot god grows a vine to cool him he built a, by the way jonah built a, an altar a, a tabernacle they said he basically he built a lean-to protect him from the heat and as he's there, God grew up a vine that was a large vine. I don't understand the vines in this way, but he, he, he grew up a vine, and it, and it brought cool, cool and comfort to Jonah. And then during the night, God sent a worm. The worm ate the vine. The next day, the, the vine is gone, and Jonah is so hot and so miserable. He's so, he's so ready and complaining, and he says, I, I just want to die. He'd gone up there to watch the demise of, of, of Nineveh. Instead, they are repenting, and God is happy, and Jonah is sad. And there, as he's watching Nineveh, he gets so miserable and so hot, and he basically is about to faint, and he says, I just want to die. Have you ever been that sick? I just want to die. And here's what he says. Here's what God says. God starts another prayer with Jonah. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? God, Jonah, by the way, is lamenting the plant. It's gone. That poor plant, it's all gone. Why? Why, God? Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And Jonah said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not, and should not I pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle?
Actually, I often think about our culture, all that's going on on the political arena and in schools and in uh, just, just the world in which we live, in which we try to minister. What I'm convinced, even in the educational systems, is that we have people who are under a delusion of the enemy and they don't know their right hand from their left. They make some of the oddest decisions. It's like common sense is done left. Elvis has left the building. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to common sense, it's gone. What I see so often is people trying to fix their own problems in society. When the kind of problems they're trying to fix, only God can. I see it in school all the time. Be kind, be nice, but nobody ever tells the kids, why is that important? God does. When prayer goes wrong, let me, let me just wrap this up. When prayer goes wrong, there are reasons for it. Number one, um, we're probably not listening. And that's often because we don't want to hear what God is saying to us. We get these impressions. That is prayer, by the way. And we just don't like where God is going with this. You know what I'm talking about? Sometimes my wife will come along and she says to me, hey, we need to talk about this. And what are you talking about? And then she's going someplace I know I don't want to go. I know it's going to involve a honeydew list, and she's going to want to. Just the other day, the other day she said, "Well, the kids are going to. We, our kids are going to come home the week after Christmas." And she starts having this conversation I don't want to have about redding up the upstairs bedrooms. You know, we hardly ever go up there except for I use a shower up there. Uh, those beds don't get used to unless the family comes, and there's sheets to change. And there, the last time we. Uh, had someone here, it was Bebo, and Bebo made a real mess up there. You know what kids can do to a room. Now, when she starts bringing this stuff up, she does it kind of casually and slowly. She's got to let me warm up to it. You know what? God does that sometimes, too. He lets us warm up to it. But a lot of times, we don't hear because we don't like where it's going. And so we don't, isn't that we can't listen, is that we don't want to listen. And it'll show up in our prayers in a whole lot of ways. Sometimes, sometimes we go to prayer, we think we're doing this cool thing and we're doing this really super spiritual thing and we're having prayer with God and we're telling God all about it. And we don't stop telling God all about it because we know the minute we stop, he's going to start and we got to listen. So we just keep on talking and we close it with an amen. Thank you, that was good, God. Nice talk. You know what I'm saying? And prayer goes wrong. And that's what Jonah was doing. It's like, I'm getting out of the presence of the Lord. I, I'll do anything. If, we're, if, if he had a vocal prayer, I'm going to do all the talking until he finds himself in deep, deep need of God. Another reason that prayer goes wrong is we lose perspective on our position. That is that he is God and we were created by him, for him. And my station and my position is to be an ambassador. My station and my position is to go and to make disciples and to teach them to obey everything that he has said or commanded. That sound familiar? And so we lose perspective perspective on our position that he is God and we are not. And when we do that, then prayer goes wrong in a real big way. And sometimes we're doing all kinds of church stuff and we're doing religious stuff and we're doing God stuff, but we're not really keeping in mind who's in charge and who is not. And we think we can go to Tarshish because we like it better. We don't like the work in Nineveh. Another place where the prayer goes wrong is we become more concerned for our comfort. Jonah did that. Have you ever noticed that accomplishing the Great Commission takes us so far out of our comfort zone that it isn't funny? I mean, tell me that that isn't just me, please. Please. 
share in the great commission, to do what God has asked us to do, takes us out of the comfort zone. You know what I would rather do? I'd rather tell people about Jesus here when you come in because you're interested and there's no threat. It's pretty comfortable. And I like the music that was going on today. And I like the service. And I like the happenings. And I like the smiles. And I like hanging with the people of God. And I just, this is comfortable. Baby, I like it. I tell people that, I tell people at work, I got the greatest church. It's a good church. You ought to try my church. Why do I think that way? Because I love being here. I'm comfortable with you. You know what to expect. I know what to expect. But when I do the work of God, God takes me to places that aren't comfortable. Did you catch that with Jonah? Jonah wanted comfort. Jonah wanted to set up on the hill and have his shade and his cake, and he wanted to be able to eat it with his frosting and a cherry on top, mind you. And if he doesn't get it that way. He's not caring what's going on down there. He just wants his comfort. God, give me my easy chair. Lastly, when prayer goes wrong, we lose sight of the value of God's creation. I wish I wish I could say <clears throat> that I never did that one. By the way, I'm guilty of all of these. <laughs> I just want you to know. I'm sorry so are you, but I'm guilty of all of these. God help me. But when we lose sight of the value of God's creation, we lose sight of the vision and the mission. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, <laughs> oh, God saw our value. It doesn't say it that way, but it says that while we were still sinners, someone died for us, bought us our salvation. It's all our value, in other words. I am. Uh, I suppose most recent, and I know I've shared this pretty much almost weekly, but but it's just really been burned into my retinas, if you will, of my mind. You know, I can't get that image out of my head of how when I first got to Friedel and I saw all the stuff that I hated seeing, and I was just sure that every person there was deplorable. That's been used before, right? I can borrow that one. Gosh. God sure has opened my eyes. He illuminated. He educated. And all the while I'm praying, but God keeps showing. God keeps revealing. God keeps communicating. God keeps communicating. God keeps his part of the prayer impressing upon. These are good people. And I had lost their value. These are people that God came to die for. He didn't just come to die for me, save me. He came to die for everybody. When prayer goes wrong, let me just repeat these four, four things. We're not listening, mostly because we don't want to. We lose perspective on our position, that is, that he is God. We are created by him for him. We are more concerned about our comfort, and we lose sight of the value of God's creation. Let me just make this closing statement. Prayer connects our heart to God's heart, does it? You guys are important to me. You know why? No, no, hear me when I say this. I can't be and feel your every need. I'm not your savior. I pray for you all the time. Think about you constantly. Think constantly about Lord, and I ask questions of the Lord, like, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to accomplish? 
Sometimes prayer is action. Sometimes it's inaction. Sometimes when I pray, God wants us to do some things. Sometimes when I pray, God wants us to do nothing. Be still and know that I am God. We don't move until God says we move. But I'm here to tell you that one of the things that God is moving me on and telling me that we are to move on, and that is this very topic, prayer. It's warfare. There's a way to do it right. And there's a way to do it wrong, prayer going wrong. Right? Talk about how to do it right, now talk about how to do it wrong, talk about why it was important in the second one, the second message. But prayer connects our heart with God's heart. When that happens, we get mission, we get vision, we get purpose. We become, I hope not driven, but led. Be all that God wants us to be. It's a cool thing. It's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. I've not given up on this church. I've seen it go way, way lower than I wanted to. I've seen what COVID has done to us. I've worked hard. I've never worked, I think, probably hard to understand, but during COVID, when I didn't have any people showing up, I was working harder than I'd ever worked before. <laughs> really strange. I'm tired. At the same time, I'm hopeful, energetic. God is up to something. We're going something. All I'm asking you to do is what God has asked me to ask you to do, and that is to pray. If my people called by my name. Christian, humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins. Oh, this is what I'm looking for. Heal their land. I pray for you. Father, there is, there is a world, a city that I live in, probably makes Nineveh look good in your eyes, I think, sometimes when I look at it. There are things that are happening that I think, God, you probably aren't going to stay another minute away, and yet you do. And then there's me, planted in the middle of it, put in a place that makes me real uncomfortable. They ask me to say and do things, all in your timing, of course, that I find hard. At the same time, Lord, I am so sure that you are causing my heart to become like your heart in all this prairie, praying that's going on between us. And I know because I'm a leader in your congregation that you have plans for all of us in it. I don't know everything. Now, I can only see about as far as tomorrow possibly out. But I have a vision of your mission. People need the Lord. And I'm willing, <laughs> and I'm uncomfortable. Sometimes, like Jonah, I, could, I whine a little, Lord. But I'm still yours. They still matter. And sandwiched all in the middle of that, Lord, I am a pastor, and these are my people, and you asked me to help them, and I'm trying. 
And I feel the Lord inadequate at best. And they're precious. <laughs> and they're good people too. And I'm convinced, Lord, that you called me here and that you want to do something great. And that you're just looking at our fidelity, our faithfulness in it. You give us hope. You give us station. You give us a work and a vision. And we're grateful for it. Lord, thank you. We, we've learned how to do prayer right. We've learned how prayer is done wrong. We've learned why prayer is so important. Lead us. Lead us, Lord. Not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Yours is the kingdom. Forever and ever. And all the people of God said, amen and amen. God bless you. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. Good to be with you. Fun stuff. Fun stuff.